Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Right, right. You can put a down payment and, and you could put CapEx out of your pocket up front when you should. I highly encourage that. Uh, but yeah, you don't want to be going negative every month because you forgot that you, we have unit turns and you forgot that we have capital expenditures. Mm. Um, and those are real expenses and they do happen. Trust me. Hello and welcome to Pillars of Wealth Creation, where we talk about creating financial success with a special focus on business and real estate. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. Now, let's get to it. Are you ready to start investing in real estate today, but don't know where to start? Sometimes investing can seem way too complicated, but it actually couldn't be any easier than with homeinvest.com. You know the co-founder and my friend, Nate Armstrong. He appeared on episode 20, and if you haven't heard it, go back and listen to it, episode number 20. Home Invest is a company that allows you to invest in turnkey real estate. Their goal is to build powerful investment tools that make real estate investing accessible to everyone. They have contractors and property managers available for you with the click of your mouse. While other real estate agents can only offer a property, Home Invest brings you a full turnkey package that allows you to diversify your investments, earn passive income, and start building equity in properties. Their simple, intuitive design allows newcomers and experienced investors alike to hit the ground running and to be able to choose the properties when they want and where they want. View easy to understand charts and data to allow you to buy in only a few clicks or just a simple phone call. With Home Invest, you'll be building your portfolio as quickly or as slowly as you would like. And right now, Home Invest is giving our listeners, Pillar of Wealth Creation listeners, a free course on how to finally win in real estate investing. So go to homeinvest.com forward slash pillars. That's homeinvest.com forward slash pillars to claim your free course today. Hey, welcome back, Pillars of Wealth Creation listeners. We have another hump day hustle. I'm your host, Todd Dexammer. With me, as always, is John Styles with Bridge Realty. John, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Todd. How are you today? I am fantastic. I've got some new motivation behind me. I'm going to get healthy and lean and mean. Well, maybe not mean. I don't know that I can be, but... <laughs> I was at our um, alumni cross country deal. I did cross country in college. Um, I used to be, well, semi fast. I was never like lightning fast uh, college runner, but I, I was at least good enough to, oh, be semi competitive, right? So, so, anyways, so we were out doing this alumni race, and I decided, oh, I'm going to run it, and I'm in terrible shape. So I ran and I ran like the slowest I've ever ran before. <laughs> it's still probably fast compared to most people. I, I ran a seven minute mile for four miles, um, seven minute pace. So, but that's slow for me. So I'm like, all right, let's cut this fat stuff out and <laughs> get back in shape. So now since then, that was on Saturday. I did a 25 mile bike ride the next day, like really hard bike ride. And then I've now ran for the last couple of days and been working out. So I'm like, all right, so I'm motivated for now. I got to keep that up. Uh, there's a guy who I wouldn't call him a friend, but uh, I, I know him. Uh, and he's like, he's been working out every single day for the last couple of years. And uh, it's like, man, what am I doing? Why don't, why don't I just, I need to start consistently working out because you feel so much better after you do it. Like I just went for a, a six mile run um, a few hours ago and I feel so much better af just after that six mile run. So, so I'm like, I'm fired up. I'm motivated to cut the fat out of my body. <laughs> Get in shape. Yeah. Um, well, cool. John, what do you got going on? Anything, uh, anything exciting you want to talk about? Not, Nothing too new. I'm, it's it's kind of like uh, the daily grind of of um, taking care of my clients and trying to get new clients and 
a lot of the behind the scenes stuff with getting new websites up and running and getting, you know, a lot of back end marketing, trying to get that figured out. So keeping at it. So cool, cool. Yeah. So for me, um, I, I had a conversation uh, with one of my, my mentors and, um, or my coach and we we talk we talked a little bit about or quite a bit about this you know what's going on in the multifamily space and you know, deals are hard to find and I'm trying to be very conservative and I'm not going to rush into any deal so we were just talking about look I still want to buy multifamily that's that's where I want to be I want to I want to grow that business and I want to be ten thousand twelve thousand fifteen thousand whatever I want to have units plenty of multifamily. But at the same time, I would rather not get into a multifamily today. That's going to be trouble for me when the market does go down. And so I, I said, well, look, I still want to look at multifamily, but maybe I'm going to take a step back and hone the relationships I have right now continue to grow those with the brokers, make those as strong as I can, but yet not focus on building new relationships, not focus on new markets, just focus on what I'm at right now, which will take, then allow me more time. Uh, because I spend a lot of time on researching markets, on connecting with new brokers, on connecting with, you know, new, uh, you know, lenders and management companies and stuff like that. And then looking at all these other deals in different markets. So I said, look, I think I'm going to pull back doing that and that'll free up more time. And so right now my focus is on being super conservative, making sure if we get a deal, it's going to be really good for my investors and really good for the future. If we don't get a deal, then no big deal. So with that, then I'm going to start ramping up and I, I've been putting some thought into it and I haven't decided exactly how I'm going to go about it, but I've got a contracting license and a contracting company and that works really well with my in-state stuff. I can ramp that up. I've got my real estate license. Um, that works fairly well with the in-state stuff. I can ramp that up. And I also uh, have a real passion to start uh, coaching um, people, multifamily coaching and stuff like that. I, I really enjoy, I was a teacher, right? And I enjoy that. I enjoyed that aspect of teaching. So I think I'm going to start doing that uh, and start offering coaching services to people and helping them get started in, in multifamily. And I, I'm sitting here saying, well, I'm not going to be super aggressive in buying multifamily. And I think I can help a lot of people instead of saying, I mean, now's a great time to learn, right? Now's a great time to get yourself set up, get your investors, get all that stuff set up. So when the market does shift and it's favorable for you to buy, you can jump in. You've got the education. You're not just waiting. I think I can think of when I, when 2008 happened and I just started investing, I just started, I was so green. I look back and I laugh how green I was. Had I known what I know now, it would have been a totally different story from 2008 to 2000, probably 13 or 14 it would have been just a totally different story. Um, which, I, you know, it is what it is. It is I'm, I'm positioned where I am and the next cycle I'll be able to take full advantage of it because now I do know a lot more. Now I still will learn a ton, right? I'll still learn a ton. Even through this next cycle, I'll be saying the same thing. I'll go, well, geez, if I knew what I knew then, I would have taken more advantage of it. I'm sure I'll be saying that exact same thing. But at the same time, I'm, I'm miles ahead of where I was in 2007 or 2008. So hoping to kind of help other people kind of get at least closer to that position to where when it does happen, I can, you know, they can, they can take advantage of it. I, I can watch that evolution as, as well. So, so those, that's kind of what I'm working on, just trying to, you know, build some different arms of my business um, and set myself and my investors up for the best position on any multifamily that we buy now, and especially multifamily that we're going to be buying when the market 
does shift into our advantage into a buyer's market. So, yeah, it sounds like you're doing some shifting of your focuses, which is um, definitely good. You don't want to lose sight of, of your main goal there, right? But, but you can put all the effort into something that you have and yet still not succeed at it if it's not the right time. So, yeah, exactly. Um, I think, and I don't, I can't verify this story because I didn't, I didn't do the research, but somebody said that uh, Warren Buffett and his um, investing, I don't know, partner, uh, but, but a, a person that, you know, kind of has done a lot of investing with him, or maybe it was, it was his partner anyway, that Warren Buffett has so many more, so much more money than this other guy and asked the difference. Um, this other guy said, well, you know, Buffett didn't invest for a two year period of time back in whatever time it was. I can't remember the exact dates, but essentially it was, Hey, he stopped investing for, for a two year period of time. He didn't see any good deals out there. So he just stopped investing and that's what set him apart. He didn't lose any money during that position during that shift. And he was able to take full advantage where this other guy was still investing, but all those investments he was then now losing money on and not able to, to basically to reinvest and capitalize on it. So at times there's times where you've got to be uh, just cautious and, and not necessarily jumping out and buying every deal that comes about. I mean, I'm getting outbid on deals, John, by, by a lot. I mean, this this latest deal I, I I bid on I was at I thought I'm coming in fairly aggressive compared to what I normally do and uh, and it's going to trade for a million dollars over what I'm I'm uh, willing to pay for it and and that's that you know so I'm 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 willing to pay ten and it's going to go for about eleven so it's going to pay trade for you know ten percent over what I'm looking at and and there's plenty of other deals that are even more than that are even going for 15 20 25 percent over i just had a deal that i bid oh 16.8 i think on or set right around 17 it's going to go for right around 19 million and i thought it was coming in again you know fairly aggressive on it yet other people are coming in at 19 million two million over what i'm what i'm willing to pay so it just you know goes to show you that, uh, or, or for me at least, that you just you got to be patient. You can't just be out there buying everything, and eventually you're going to be happy that you didn't buy some of those deals because you're going to be buying them at a cheaper price. Probably <laughs> you're going to be buying from those people that overpaid. Yeah. yeah. Well, you must have been talking too much about your markets because other people got the wit got word that they were hot places to go. <laughs> <laughs> That's maybe a mistake, right? I talked about uh, some of the markets that I uh, was investing in. I, I have actually openly talked about that. And then a lot of people have came into those markets and, but I just think, I don't even think it was necessarily that. It's not like I have that huge of a reach. It's just that, uh, you know, if you're looking at the same, things that I'm looking at, the same fundamentals, you, it doesn't take too long to notice those markets. Hey, I want to interrupt this episode real quick to talk to you about Nate Armstrong. Uh, our sponsor, Nate Armstrong, he's with homeinvest.com and you want to get to know Nate. So go to homeinvest.com and just connect with Nate, talk to him. Learn about his operation, what he's got going on. He's a turnkey provider, and it may not be right for you, but it could be the perfect fit. So it doesn't hurt. It's a free call, free consultation just to figure out, you know, what they do, what they have to offer. And worst case is you're going to meet a great person who's really well educated in real estate. He's done a ton of different real estate strategies, and probably is going to teach you a little bit even on a short conversation uh, with him. So go to homeinvest.com and, and uh, connect with Nate's company. You're definitely not going to be disappointed. It's worth it. So uh, thanks. And we'll get back to our show. We got off the topic, but I wanted to talk today about the differences in expenses. 
and, and what those are. So John, can you talk about the, the different types of expenses that we're going to have um, in a property as far as work needing to be done on them? Yeah, um, there's, there's quite a few different things. Uh, some expenses are going to be routine, such as utilities, uh, management fees, and um, then there's going to be maintenance expenses. Um, and, and what those are can vary quite broadly. Um, now, if you've done, you know, a big renovation on the property, hopefully there's not too much to maintain there, but things do break. And sometimes it's because of, you know, it being an old or, um, you know, defective issue, or maybe the tenant damaged it, um, can be high wear and tear sometimes. So, you know, those can be anything from a broken uh, toilet handle, flush valve, or a leaky faucet, um, doorbell is not working. So those are kind of just a brief summary of some of those. So those are kind of your day-to-day -day maintenance items. I think in my experience, John, day-to-day, -day, the biggest things that seem to have the most amount of issues is two things. is going to be plumbing mm -hmm. and HVAC, your heating and your air conditioning. Uh, the other I would call, well, I would say is appliances. So it seems like those have the most amount of issues. Those are have a, the most, most of our calls are because of those things. Sure. Uh, what is, is that kind of been your experience as far as properties you own and have, uh, have looked over? Yeah, those are, I think those are high calls probably because they affect the tenant's convenience, mm -hmm. you know, and, and their comfort. You know, nobody wants to be in a cold apartment when it's, when it's cold out or um, in a hot apartment when it's hot out, they, we often want it the opposite. Yep. Um, and, and that could turn into safety issues of course, as well. Um, then appliances, you know, if, if you're not able to cook or you're not able to store your food, that's a, um, a serious convenience issue. Um, so I think we get those calls more often because uh, the tenants inconvenienced on that. Whereas some other maintenance things might need to be done but if it's not inconveniencing the tenant, they might not think or bother to call you on that. Well, and that's a very good point. I think a lot of times the tenants just don't call, uh, especially on the things that maybe aren't necessarily a bad thing. One of the things that I get where people don't call uh, quite a bit is plumbing leaks because that's not an inconvenience to them because they're uh, most often they're not paying the bills. Now, if they are, then they're going to call you about it. But if they're not, then most often they just let those leaks happen. So we're implementing into our apartments um, metering systems that will allow or tell us when the leaks are happening. We just had um, one of our properties. Uh, it's a bunch of, of four unit buildings all in a row and we get the bills on the four unit buildings and, and uh, they're between 150 and $200. And one of them was about $1,100. Wow. So you go, Holy cow. You know, now we got this $1,100 bill. We go in there and sure enough, it's a pipe just leaking in the laundry room. Nobody told us about cause they don't care. It's in the laundry room. Um, and it's just leaking. So it's a thousand, almost a thousand dollars extra that we had to spend on that plus the repair yet if we had this system it would have told us within 24 hours that there's a leak we would have spent maybe an extra 50 bucks on the uh on that water bill that month because we would have caught it right away yet that system only costs a few hundred dollars to install so it, it would have saved us big time money uh, for that. So, so having something like that in place is, is really, really important. I think on a, especially on a multifamily or charging the tenants, the, the water, if you can charge it. You, so, so a rubs is maybe not as 
good of a charge because they don't necessarily see that uh, bill. But if you can actually meter it to where you're charging them, that's that's a great thing. Um, yeah, another uh, category to think about is if you have either city inspections or Section 8 inspections. Mm -hmm. Those often reveal a lot of kind of minor concerns. Yeah, picky stuff. But they can add up to be quite a large expense yep. uh, between, you know, changing the batteries in the smoke detectors or making sure a handrail has the right turn towards the wall or, um, you know, a lot of minor things, but they, they really add up. Yeah. So that it, we've got... So, so we've got maintenance expenses, right? Those are the day-to-day -day stuff. You're going to have to have a, somebody run out and, and fix those things. Um, we also have when a, when a tenant moves out, John, and what, you know, what kind of experiences have you had when, when tenants move out? Do you, have you looked even on, on what your average is or anything like that? Or do you have an, a, an idea? No, it's, it's really hard to, for me anyways uh to come up with an average because it varies so much by the tenant sure um i have you know back when i was managing properties i had kind of a, a printout sheet i would give to our owners ahead of time to say you know these are some expenses you should expect and even if we've had the very best tenant in there who's been very clean you need to expect that there's going to be some expenses there's you know, there's some things that you can't charge to a tenant's deposit because it's normal wear and tear. So for example, a carpet only has a certain life expectancy and that kind of gets prorated um, depending on how long they've lived there. Um, most turnovers, you're gonna need painting and you typically can't charge a tenant for just touch up painting. You know, if they've completely trashed the wall and they've, their kids have colored all over the place, you know, that's, that's beyond normal wear and tear and that's damage, which can be charged to the tenant's deposit. Um, but again, you know, there's only so much deposit there. Um, so, in, and sometimes you wanna take advantage of those turnover opportunities to make improvements, uh, you know, kind of do at least maybe a minor, maybe a major renovation to that unit. Um, so you might be, changing out all the flooring and updating the cabinets and appliances, you know, just depending on what your business plan is for that property. So yep. that's why coming up with an average is, is quite difficult for me anyways. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. We, we've kind of taken a look at, uh, at our averages. And again, it varies and averages is, is uh, you know, a hard word to say because one tenant might be $50 and another tenant might be, you know, three thousand dollars. Another tenant might be two hundred dollars. Another tenant might be eight thousand dollars. You know, I've had them all over the map. But uh, I would uh, our average is right around seven hundred and fifty per tenant uh, on a move out. And so, with that, now here's here's what I'll say. We this is this is my portfolio in the Twin Cities, by the way. This isn't my apartment. So my own portfolio in the Twin Cities is 750. With that, we have single family houses and we have some smaller like duplexes and stuff. Obviously the duplexes uh, is a lot less typically. And then it's also depending on the, the neighborhood they're in. I've got C-class properties and I've got uh, probably, you know, I've got a couple that are, I would call them like B plus, A minus properties. So my t typically my B plus A minus, like I just had a, a B plus, I would call it a B plus A minus property. They moved out, they lived there for six years and my expense is gonna be on um, that is, uh, well, not including, I'm gonna do a couple upgrades, th those I'm not including. But, but on that, my expense is gonna be about $300. You know, we've got some paint touch-ups, we've got a little bit of minor cleaning, and that's about it. So, so uh, you know, they, they very, definitely vary, but we do need to be cognizant that their turnover costs are real. Uh, and I just had a, I manage a property for one of my friends. And I just had a conversation with him. His tenant uh, that we put in there, uh, well, he had, a, he, had a, he had a tenant that was in there prior to me taking over management. 
she trashed the place. We put in probably, uh, this was years ago, this is maybe five years ago, five or six, maybe even, uh, we put in a tenant, I'm oh, sorry, we put in um, probably eight grand worth of renovation because this tenant trashed the place. Now this tenant's been there ever since and we haven't raised the rent on her, yet the market hasn't really gone up a ton in rent. She has been so consistent and I said, well, look, the average tenant in that market and where you're, this is like a D plus area. The, the average tenant in your area is going to stay for probably two years in a single family house. Okay. And they are going to, that average tenant is probably going to cost you between a thousand and two thousand dollars in a unit turn just because of the type of tenants you're having. Maybe even more than that. We're probably a hundred dollars behind market on, on market rent. So we're charging 12, we could be charging 13. Well, if you look at that, that's 1200 bucks a year. If you look at the savings we've had, they're probably actually doing better by keeping that tenant at market rate or at, at the current uh, rent versus raising that tenant up because they don't have unit turn fee, fees and they don't have lease up fees. I'm gonna charge them if I've got to lease that property up. I'm going to charge them more on a move in, move out. So, so they're, they're saving quite a bit in fees. And so sometimes it's worth trying to keep tenants in properties uh, versus having those turnover costs. Yeah, definitely. We've talked a lot about in the past about keeping rents up, but that's the other side of the, of the coin is, you know, what's it going to cost if you push the rent so far that you have to have a turnover. Yeah, I'm doing rent raises on uh, 12 of my properties right now. And some of them are, are you know, I could raise over $100 uh, if I wanted to, to get them back up to market. Um, but I want to keep most of those tenants. There's actually one that I could care less if they stay or not. Uh, I'm not going to name any names. <laughs> But so I did raise theirs $125. And if they move, fine. If they stay, uh, well, they, they, uh, I guess they get to stay. Um, but yeah, you've just got to understand that if you raise these rents, there's going to be chance that some tenants are going to leave, especially if you're going to raise them a lot. So that's the key of raising small amounts. And that's what I told them. I said, look, there's some repairs that need to be done. The roof had hail damage. She wants this roof replaced. We're going to replace that. She, she likes the house. She wants a couple other things done. We're going to do those things. And then we're going to say, hey, uh, we'd love to have you signing your lease. And we're going to raise your rent up a little bit. Here's what market is. We're not even going to bring you up to market and, and see what her reaction is. We can always retract and say, well, look, we talked. I talked with the, the, the owner and they decided, look, they really do want you to stay. Uh, we'll keep it at your $1,200. You can always try to do that. Um, you know, you could still lose them, but, uh, so anyways, the next expense is I think the one that most people get really, well, turnover expense. I think people lose track of too. They don't pay attention to turnover costs that, that, and that's, that's a big one to, to watch for when you're looking at pro formas and you're looking at these single families, especially is we don't consider turnover costs as part of our costs. So that's a really big thing I think people need to be aware of, on turn, uh, that we have turnover costs. That those cost money anytime a tenant moves out. You can't just, like you said, John, you can't just take their security deposit. Just because you have to replace the carpet and repaint some of the walls doesn't mean you get to take their security deposit. They've got rights and every state's different in, in the rights that they have. But in the state of Minnesota, they've ten, our tenants have a lot of rights and you can't do stuff like that. So you're going to have those costs. The other cost is capital expenditures. And a lot of people lose track of what capital expenditures really mean and what they're actually going to cost because most capital expenditures are items that don't break down um, daily, monthly, yearly. Most capital expenditures are items that might last five to 
30 plus years. So John, what are, what are a few capital expenditures that, that people aren't thinking of on a day to day basis, but will catch them eventually? Yeah, I think large ones would be your roofing and your siding. Mm -hmm. Um, Then other ones could be your appliances. Um, And I think part of the indicator of whether or not it's capital expense is, does your accountant want to depreciate it over so many years? Yep. Kind of of the rule I've heard, John, is five is the expense on a single item. So the appliance is at $500 or more is kind of the, the rule of thumb. Now it doesn't necessarily mean that's the hard line rule because I think you could capital expense a dishwasher that costs you $250. Um, but you're not going to capital expense, uh, you know, paint touch-ups for instance. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then other just large renovations. So if you're doing a full bathroom remodel, um, because it's completely outdated and hard to maintain, um, you know, that would be another capital expense. Yeah. So here's what I want to talk about next. So we've mentioned the the three types we mentioned just day-to-day repairs and maintenance. We mentioned, uh, unit turns, Right, and we mentioned capital expenditures, the things that are going to eventually break down your furnace, your uh, AC, your roof, your siding, your windows, your your doors, um, your appliances. Um, yeah, I, I, there's there's other things. Um, so we mentioned all those. Of course, the other expenses that we have, and I would kind of include this in your in kind of in your repairs and maintenance is uh, maintenance would be your lawn care, your other landscaping, that stuff you've got to consider that's going to be there. Um, so, so how do we figure out how much do we budget? And I think that's where people get uh, caught up. First of all, you have to understand that these are true expenses just because capital expenses are in a different line item. And a lot of people put them below their profit loss. The, you know, they're not in their NOI. They put it outside of their NOI. A lot of people, honestly, sellers put them below the NOI. Buyers put them in above the NOI. So, but just because they're capital expenses doesn't mean they're not expenses. These are true expenses that are eventually going to happen. And you have to understand how to budget for them. So essentially, you know, the easiest way is let's think of a single family house. Okay. So a single family house, we've got a roof, we've got siding, we've got windows, we've got a furnace, we've got a water heater, we've got an air conditioner, we've got uh, our appliances, and we and there's more. So, so we've got those items. And what we're going to do is we're going to give a life expectancy of those items. And we're going to give a value of those items. How long do they take before they break down? Or oh, sorry, I said that. How, how much do they cost to repair when they do break down? Okay, so, so let's say our roof, for instance, we got a roof and we bought this house and we go, okay, this house, this roof today, let's get a quote on it if, we, if we'd have no clue. Um, otherwise, you know, in, in Minnesota, I can say $300 a square is a, is a new roof for material, roofing, labor, all that kind of stuff, 300 bucks a square. Okay. How, how big is my roof? It's 20 square. Okay. That's going to cost me $6,000. Roof is going to last me if I use the right shingles 30 years. Okay. So I take $6,000 I divide that by 30. And that's what I should save each year for that, for that roof. I can divide that by 12 and that's what I would save each month. And I go through my line items and I, get the actual what it's going to cost me for that house. Okay. So that's a house example. We're going to go through every big line item, all the main items. We think about this house and what it's going to cost. This isn't our maintenance expense. The maintenance is a totally separate thing. I would consider my maintenance and my unit turns at 15% of my gross rents. That's what I would do for a single family house. My maintenance and my turns, I consider at 15%. My CapEx expenses, on a single family, I usually find it's about $200 a, uh, a month, so right around there. 
Uh, but it, it, you know, your house, every house is different, right? A duplex is going to be a little bit less per you per unit um, because it's one building still, right? So you still got just one roof. You still got, uh, you might have two HVACs depending on how it's set up, but you still got one roof. You've still got uh, the same amount of siding, the same windows essentially for a, an apartment building. That's even more different. That's, that's harder to understand. But what I am looking at an apartment building, when I buy an apartment building, I buy an apartment building and I do two things. First of all, I have my initial CapEx budget, right? So in my initial CapEx budget is going to be equal to nine months of principal and interest payments. So nine months of my mortgage payments, I'm going to set aside. That's CapEx. Okay. Not reserves. Oh, well, reserves, whatever you want to call it. Yep. I, I put that to the side. That's what I'm going to have for reserves, for CapEx, whatever you want to call it. Then what I do is I save $300 per year per unit. So if I got a hundred unit building, I'm putting away $30,000 per year. Okay. That's if my property has new stuff right? So that's if I'm renovating my property. If I'm not renovating my property, $300 per month is probably not going to cut or per year, it's probably not going to cut it. So typically when I'm buying a property, I'm renovating it. I'm putting in new appliances. I'm putting in, um, if the windows are in need, I'm putting in new windows. If the roof's in need, I'm putting on a new roof, stuff like that. So I'm doing those things up front and I'm actually raising extra money to do that. So if I'm going to put in a million dollars into that building, I'm raising that up front. That's going into my renovation budget. That way my CapEx can still stay at that, you know, $30,000 or whatever, how many units I have, 300 per year per, per unit. Um, and, and then I should be covered. Now, what happens if I don't do that? Well, then you've got to, again, do that exercise. You know, how, how long is that roof going to last? Is it a $100,000 roof? That's a $100,000 roof and it's only got five years left. We need to itemize that and figure out what we need to set aside for it. Maybe we raise some of it up front and then some of it out of the cash flow. And that's a good point. Where, where does the reserves come from? They come out of the cash flow, right? And so if I, if I'm, if I'm positive, let's call it a single family house. If I'm positive 500 bucks a month, I'm going to take 250 and I'm going to put that in my reserve account, my CapEx account. Um, so I, I any, anyways, I, I, I think for people that need, that are looking at buying multifamily, buying single family, buying duplexes, it's just super important to not forget the true expenses that are going to be into these properties. Cause I think 90% of people that are either just starting out or even people who've been in the business for a little while, forget that these are expenses. It's so easy to not think about some of these expenses that are going to happen, but didn't aren't going to happen today. Yeah. So do you have separate budgets that you put together? So there's your, there's your kind of, monthly ongoing budget mm -hmm. and then there's there's your capital expense budget which is going to have a lot of vario varying line items you know depending if you for example didn't replace the roof initially when you bought it because it it was it had some life expectancy still remaining but you know it's going to need it in five years or whatever it is then, so then you need to put more aside you need to budget more of that reserve or capital expense account for that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, John, like, let's use your example. That's a good, a good example. If I've got a roof and I go, this thing's got five years left. Well, first of all, if it's got five years left, we don't know if it's got five or one. Okay. So what I would do in that, if I was certain, like this has got minimum of five years left, maybe up to 10. What I would do in that case is I would raise a good chunk of that money up front for it. The rest of that money then 
I would have through my CapEx. I would have an increased CapEx until we do replace that roof or at least until we get to uh, that number to replace a roof. So instead of 300, I might be doing, maybe I'm up to 400 per unit per year uh, because of my roof. So I'm getting an extra 10 grand each year so by year five, I've got an extra 50 grand. I raised 50 grand up front. Now I've got 100 grand to redo that roof by year five. Now, if on year five, the roof is still good and I haven't replaced it, and I'm still positive it's only gonna cost me $100,000 to do that roof, I might drop my CapEx now down to 300 because I already raised for that roof, um, assuming everything else is going well, of course. Um, I might drop that down to 300. So that's kind of what I, what I would consider doing and something like that. Yeah. And then do you separate those capital exp um, expense reserves? Do you actually separate those, separate those in, into a physically separate bank account? So you don't get tempted to touch it or, or you just keep it all tracked, you know, tracked in the books and. I put it into a separate bank account. Uh, that's just my practice. Uh, you don't have to. I mean, cer certainly you can keep it in, in its own, but I like, I like things in their separate. It's, it's really easy to set up a savings account. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and, and then you're actually making interest on it, but not a lot, but you know, you're making a couple bucks on it. You can put it in a mar money market account and you can make a few bucks on it and you know, it's better than nothing. Yeah. We're going to go to Vegas and gamble with it. And hope, hopefully you increase it by 20, 25%. <laughs> well, I think a, Just, a lot. Of but by the way, I don't recommend doing that unless you're really good at, at <laughs> poker. <you know>. Right. <laughs> I just think a lot of people, we have this weird mindset about money and we see it in the mm -hmm. account or it seems like it's available where it really should be. Um, you know, it's set aside and it's for a certain purpose. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really important to set it aside for its own purpose because it's going to be used. And I've had people ask me too, is like, Oh, when I get to a certain point, do you stop, do you stop your increasing your cap X budget? No. You know, I mean, yeah, maybe if you're crazy amount high, maybe, but um, in five years, if you think, geez, I haven't touched my CapEx budget. But you got to think, what were those things that I was CapExing for? Yeah. Oh, yeah. My roof is eventually going to go bad. You know, when I first started, I didn't do much CapEx budget. What I did is I said, well, if I got five, if I got five grand in my account, that's going to cover my expenses, my, my extra expenses. So like right now, you know, I'm going, I'm going to be selling a couple houses. I, I just sold one house. The, well, the roof needed to be replaced. I didn't really set aside enough money to replace the roof and a bunch of other stuff, you know? So I had, I mean, I had money to do it, but not directly related to that property in that account. Mm -hmm. You know, I got another house. It can be the same thing. The roof is likely at, at the inspection, the inspector is going to say the roof needs to be redone. It's also got bad stucco. So they're likely going to say, look, the stucco needs to be redone. Between the two of those, it's going to cost me $10,000. Um, I didn't put that aside. You know? So where's that money going to come from? What's well, going to come from my pocket? It's not going to come from that property. Um, so so it, because I didn't budget for it, because those were some of my earlier properties that I just didn't think about that in. And then never instilled that into those properties. So, yeah. And if if you're only reporting to yourself and your accountant, you know, there's not a lot of pressure to keep things separated and and yeah. keep things the way they should be. But especially if you're working with investors and you know you're taking care of their finances, uh, their investment into the the project you know, you really got to stay on top of that stuff and make sure you're planning ahead. Here's where it's really important, John. It's really important in, in this type of market when we're buying properties and the margins are thinner than they were in 
you know, 2009 and 10, 11, um, 12. I, look, I could buy a property then and I'm buying a single family house for, shoot, I, I'm selling it one of my single family houses. I bought it for $18,000, right? My, my rent uh, started at 1150 and the tenant that uh, moved out, the last tenant that moved out was charging 1350 a month. Cash flowed pretty well. To, to say the least. I put about 15,000 in CapEx when I bought it. And uh, I mean, the numbers make sense, right? I, it, all day long. But that same property now will trade and potentially could an investor buy it, sure. If the investor bought it, it's gonna trade at 140, probably thousand is what it'll sell for right now. So now you buy it at 140,000. Now, can you cash flow properly? I would say it'd be really tough to, uh, not the way I could at least. And so when a market gets tighter like this, that's where the really importance is, is we have to understand what our numbers truly are. Because if we don't, we're gonna get stuck and all of a sudden we're gonna be spitting money into this property that we didn't really want to do it. Um, you're not buying real estate. Well, I shouldn't say this. You shouldn't be buying real estate to be putting money back into it. You shouldn't be buying real estate that hope, hoping one day it'll cash flow and one day it'll appreciate. It, it should cash flow from day one. And if it appreciates, that's a bonus. So, And you're talking about you obviously you can put money in to, for your initial cap expense, but on an ongoing monthly basis, you know after it's stabilized, you don't want to be cash flowing the in the negative direction. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, right, right. You can put a down payment and and you could put capex out of your pocket up front when you should. I highly encourage that. Uh, but yeah, you don't want to be going negative every month because you forgot that you, we have unit turns and you forgot that we have capital expenditures. Mm. Um, and those are real expenses and they do happen. Trust me. So most people consider, they go look at a rental property and they go, okay, I got to pay my mortgage. I got to pay my insurance. I got to pay, um, you know, my, some of my utilities and I got to pay uh, some maintenance. And that's all they look at. They don't consider when the tenant moves out, what's it going to cost me? They don't consider when the roof goes bad, is it, what do I have to pay for that? You know, so. Well, cool. I think that's it for me, John. You have anything to add on that the topic? No, I think that covers it. Okay. Awesome. How can our listeners get in touch with us, John? Yeah, for sure. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, just search for our name, Pillars of Wealth Creation, on Facebook or YouTube, or you can find us on iTunes and SoundCloud. And wherever you go for Pillars of Wealth Creation, you can, of course, comment, uh, leave a review, and uh, uh, we'd love to hear from you on that regard. So, Awesome. Awesome. By the way, today was the first day of kindergarten for my five-year-old. So it was really exciting this morning. It was pretty fun. He was so pumped up about it. We were, it you could just tell this morning, it was like, this is the first time he showed excitement before it was like, yeah, I got this, you know. Uh, but this morning it was like, are you excited? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like jumping up and down. He's all pumped up. So it was pretty fun. So I, it's actually, um, he's he rode the bus there. He's going to ride the bus back. He gets off the bus in about 15 minutes. I'm pretty excited to go see him uh, uh, coming off the bus. So yeah, that's fun. Yeah. Good times. All right, John. Uh, well, you have a good rest of the day, man. Make every day Saturday. You too. Are you ready to start investing in real estate today, but don't know where to start? Sometimes investing can seem way too complicated, but it actually couldn't be any easier than with homeinvest.com. You know the co-founder and my friend, Nate Armstrong. He appeared on episode 20, and if you haven't heard it, go back and listen to it, episode number 20. Home Invest is a company that allows you to invest in turnkey real estate. Their goal is to build powerful investment tools that make real estate investing accessible to everyone. They have contractors and property managers available for you with the click of your mouse. 
While other real estate agents can only offer a property, Home Invest brings you a full turnkey package that allows you to diversify your investments, earn passive income, and start building equity in properties. Their simple, intuitive design allows newcomers and experienced investors alike to hit the ground running and to be able to choose the properties when they want and where they want. View easy to understand charts and data to allow you to buy in only a few clicks or just a simple phone call. With Home Invest, you'll be building your portfolio as quickly or as slowly as you would like. And right now, Home Invest is giving our listeners, Pillar of Wealth Creation listeners, a free course on how to finally win in real estate investing. So go to homeinvest.com forward slash pillars. That's homeinvest.com forward slash pillars to claim your free course today.